All right. Are there any other children here this morning? We don't have baby Halden, but are there any other kids? Come down the front and we will sing our song. Thank you, musicians. My God is so great. Uh, every week here we read some of the words of Jesus. What did Jesus say? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe his good news. God calls all kinds of people. He calls everyone to be part of his family. And Jesus says, everyone is welcome. Just turn away from those things you know are wrong and trust in Jesus and what he's done. And what has Jesus done? In our Corinthians series, we read our memory verse from 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. What does it say? For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul, who writes this letter to, to the Corinthians, says, when we focus on Jesus and what he's done, everything else falls into place. All right. Well, we've got some special things to this morning for kids' time. We've got a special... Oh, what's going on? Oh, donkey. Yee-haw. 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 Oh, hello, donkey. We haven't seen you in a while. Yee-haw. Hello, David. Hello, kids. Yee-haw. Hello, everyone. Yee-haw. Ah. Yee-haw. You sound sad. Is everything okay? Yee-haw. No, things are not okay. I try my hardest. Yee-haw. I work at it every day. Yee-haw. I sweat and I bray and I just can not. Yee-haw. And do it. Yee-haw. Can't do what? Yee-haw. I can't lay eggs. Hee-haw. Eggs? Hee-haw. Yes, eggs. Not even one egg. Hee-haw. I do my best. Really, I do. But I just can't do it. You're trying to lay eggs? Hee-haw. Yes, and failing. Hee-haw. 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 Donkey, why are you trying to lay eggs? Well, my best hee-haw friend, Chicken, she lays eggs, hee-haw. And when Chicken lays eggs, she gets all happy and excited. The farmer gets all excited and happy, hee-haw. Everyone celebrates when Chicken lays an egg. And I want the farmer and everyone else to be excited by me as well. So I try to lay eggs, hee-haw. But I can't. Hee-haw. Well, I can think of a couple of reasons why you can't lay eggs. I mean, donkey, for one, you're a boy donkey. And secondly, you're a donkey donkey. Donkeys don't lay eggs. Hee-haw. That's what my friend Chicken says. But maybe I'm just not trying hard enough. Hee-haw. Well, how about this? When the farmer moves, needs to move something heavy around the farm... Does he hitch chicken to the wagon to pull it? Hee-haw. No. That's my job. Chickens don't pull wagons. Or when the farmer needed to move that heavy um, uh, fence post up the hill, the steep hill at the back of the property, did he get the chicken to carry it? hee-haw. Not likely. Chicken can't carry fence posts. Not up steep hills anyway. That's work for donkeys. Hee-haw. And when the children visit the farm, do they ride on chicken's back up and down the paddock? Don't be silly. They would squash chicken flat. So if chicken can't do your jobs, the things that God made you to do, why do you want to do her job, the things that God made her to do? 
Hee-haw. Hee-haw. Hmm. You make a good point, David. Hee-haw. Maybe I should just do what God made me to do. And do it the best you can, donkey. Hee-haw. I sure will. Okay. Hee-haw. No more laying eggs for donkey. Hee-haw. Goodbye, everybody. Hee-haw. 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 Hee-haw-haw-haw. Hee-haw. Hee-haw. All right. Thank you, donkey. All right. That kind of leads us into our Bible reading for today. Donkey wanted to do what chicken did, but chickens do what chickens do and donkeys do what donkeys do. Do you agree? Yes. And it's kind of the same with us as well. So God has given some of us special things we can do. And if we try to do what other people are doing, it's just not going to work. So we're going to read a little bit this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So who would like to start our reading? You're going to read? You're going to read? No? Okay, we'll start here. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Uninformed. Very good. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Good. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Good. Amen. 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 They are there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is say the same God at work. Amen. 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 No? Okay, Fred. Now, for each one, the manifestation. 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 Of the spirit is given the common good. Given for the common good. The manifestation means the appearance or the turning up, the signs of the Holy Spirit. You want to say amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. All right, very good. To one day is given through the spirit a message of wisdom to another a message of Knowledge by means of the same spirit. Good. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. Good. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the... Interpretation of tongues. Good. Amen. Amen. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes, distributes them to each one just as He determines. Very good. So in this passage, Paul is saying the Holy Spirit gives special gifts to all the people, all the people in the church. Some get this, a special gift of being able to pray for people who are sick in a special way. Some are given the power to do amazing miracles. Some are given special wisdom or special knowledge. And each person is given their own gift. And I think actually we're given more than one gift, but we'll talk about that in a minute with the grown-ups. But no matter what your gift is, it's a gift from God. And we all have a special place to play in the church. And chickens shouldn't try to be donkeys, and donkeys shouldn't try to be chickens. Does that make sense? All right, very good. So I would like everybody to get up and shake somebody's hands this morning. And our greeting this morning is from that reading. The first person will say, there are different kinds of service. And the other person will say, but the same Lord. Get up and shake somebody by the hand. We've got some folks who've come back from overseas. We haven't mentioned this morning. Sandra's back. Norma's back after a couple of weeks away. Get up and find somebody and make sure you say a special greeting to those folks. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord.
you've come in this morning and didn't get a copy of our notes, then please put your hand up. Someone will bring them to you so you can follow along, check the references later on. And there are questions on the back. <coughs> I grew up in a Salvation Army church, and so from a very young age, I learned to play a brass instrument, because that's what happens in the Salvation Army churches, at least when I was a young man. Uh, And I played in a small band at our local church. There'd be maybe six or seven players. And I, after a while, by the time I got to the end of high school, was probably the best of the players, except for the bandmaster. He was very, very good. Uh, And then I would go from that little tiny band in a country church off to the music camp on the Sunshine Coast once a year, and I discovered I wasn't all that good. I certainly wasn't as good as the boys and girls who played in the big bands in the big churches. I played a euphonium. If you don't know what a euphonium is, it's a little tuba, but it's not a bass sort of tuba. It's a colourful instrument. It adds the frills and the trills over the tops of all the beautiful pieces. So when I'm singing a hymn, sometimes I'll go, la 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 because that's what the euphonium used to do. Anyway... I would always end up being second chair euphonium. They would row, they'd sit in the row, best to worst, they'd audition us every year, and I was always number two. There are only two of us playing euphonium. The, and down the row is then the baritones, which is, again, a slightly smaller tuba, again, a horn. Anyway, the fellow sitting next to me who was always better than me is a guy named Wes Bust. He's now a policeman, uh, which is exciting for him. Anyway, uh, and then one year I turned up to camp. This had been about five years. Wes had been sitting there and I'd been sitting here playing euphonium and he was much better than me, I'll admit that. But I turned up one year and Wes didn't have his big euphonium case. He had a little cornet case because in his local church he'd been promoted to be the first chair cornet in his church. And I was so excited. I'm going to get to be end chair euphonium this year. I get to play my part. I get to do the solos. I get to be the hero of the baritones. They'll all look up to me. And do you know what? That year, the music camp brought out some special guests from America, and one of them happened to be a fellow a few years older than me who was an excellent euphonium player. He was better than Wes. If Wes had still been playing euphonium, I would have been shunted back down to being a bottom baritone, I'm pretty sure. So I've never, never, never been end chair euphonium of the South Queensland Division Young People's Band. <sighs> Sad. Sad. And I don't think at this chance that I at this point I will ever get a chance to do that. There comes a point in every man's life when he realizes he'll never play rugby league for Queensland. And there came a point in my life where I realized I'd never be end chair euphonium. Very sad. Never mind. But I still played my part. Have you ever been part of a band or an orchestra or a a choir? And when everything's going well and everyone's playing their part and when everyone is watching the conductor, everything sounds good and the harmonies are deep and rich. And there's nothing I love more actually than just going and sitting in a really good band. Just going and sitting and listening. And when I was in the Salvation Army, I would often do that as the pastor of the church. I would just go and sit in amongst them and listen to them play. Because when you're in a good band and all's going well and everyone's watching the conductor, it's a wonderful experience. It's fun. It's moving. It's inspirational. But if people are out of tune or out of time or playing the wrong music, well, there's not much worse than being in a terrible band or a terrible orchestra, or a terrible choir. My hat goes off to the school teachers whose job it is to teach grade three ensemble, the grade three recorder ensemble. Ooh. Here in first, grade four is it? That's even worse. All right. Here in first Corinthians, Paul is challenging here in these central chapters is the disharmony, the disharmony in the Corinthian church orchestra. There are some who consider themselves superior to the others, playing a more important part. And as a result, the whole symphony might be played out of balance and into disaster. And N.T. Wright, reflecting on this, says, there are different instruments, but all require the same musicianship. There are different styles of playing, 
but they're all following the same conductor. There are different tones and volumes of playing, but it's the same composer that wrote the piece and whose music must come through in the performance. Here in 1 Corinthians, we're reading a letter from a pastor to a church that he loves, where he's giving advice, he's giving feedback, he's giving direction and teaching, and he's always pointing back to Jesus Christ and him crucified. Who Jesus is and what Jesus has done is at the heart of this letter. Let's read the verse together. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And here in this central section of the letter, Paul is building up to his Mount Everest in chapter 13. But the reason for chapter 13 is here in chapter 12. There are issues in the church about spiritual things. The church is not playing nicely together. There's competition and chaos and excess. And even some pagan practices of worship have made their way into the church. And so we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Paul has given advice on practical things like head coverings and the Lord's Supper in chapter 11, and now the topic is spiritual things. The NIV says spiritual gifts, but that word gift does not appear until verse 4. In verse 1, the Greek is just spiritual things or spiritual matters. Paul says, now away from that practical stuff, let's talk about spiritual stuff. And he goes on and says, you know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to dumb idols. Paul reminds the Corinthians that before they followed Christ, they were pagans, they were Gentiles, they engaged in pagan worship. Influenced and led astray to worship silent idols, false gods. And yet there would have been people in that worshipping community, spiritual people in those pagan worship services who would claim to speak on behalf of the silent idol, the false gods. People would chant and shout and rant and make all kinds of declarations and curses, work themselves up into a state of ecstatic exuberance. And these kind of people were regarded with awe and respect in their communities. Those who could commune with the gods were special. And some of that style of worship, that style of things, seems to be present in the early Christian worship as well. Because there are those, Paul will say later, who get overly excited by the things of the Spirit and make themselves big and important, who make it all about them and their experiences. And there are concerns in the church about what's going on. Paul shares those concerns. Because how can the congregation know what is being said and done is from the real God, not from one of these false gods, or not just from the imagination of an individual? Paul proposes a simple check, a simple test. Check what they're saying and doing. In verse 3, he says, Therefore I want you to know that no one who's speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Paul says, No one who's ministering in the Spirit of God can say, Jesus be cursed. That's a sure sign of supernatural activity that's not of God. And we might go further and say that if someone is ministering in a way that brings shame or disrepute on the name of Jesus, that person's not working in the Spirit of God either. They're working in the power of the devil and of his angels. On the other hand, no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. And this is a very important statement. Jesus is Lord is one of the most basic statements of Christian faith. In Romans chapter chapter 10, verse 9, Paul sums up the whole salvation story and puts it like this. Let's read it together. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul says, if you want to be sure you're going to heaven, proclaim that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead. And that's enough. You 
will be saved. Jesus is Lord. And of course, Philippians chapter 2, and Tabitha read the longer part of it this morning, but that picture of the end times when everyone is gathered before God and every knee will bow and every person will confess and says, let's read together, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord. Paul encourages the church to look carefully at what's being said and done in the worship services and to see if it's from God and if it brings glory and honour to Jesus Christ or if it's from some other source, giving glory and honour to things other than Jesus, be they false gods or false prophets. And Paul reminds them that in all these things they should remember Jesus Christ and him crucified. He is the example of true worship, denying himself, taking up his cross and following, going the way his father wants him to go. And Paul calls us to worship in the same way, to follow the example of Jesus. Paul reminds his listeners that worship is, is as diverse as each individual, but united in the giver. And so we read on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 4. He says, there are different kinds of gifts. The same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. There's a nice parallel there. Gifts and service and work, Spirit, Lord and God. Paul doesn't get into abstract philosophical language here about how these three people relate to each other, the Spirit, the Lord, the God. But from this point, there's a straight line to the, into the explorations of the Trinity that later theologians would develop. But that's in the background. The immediate point Paul is making is that the gifts and the service and the work is different for each individual. But the giver is the same, the same spirit, the same Lord, the same God. And further, Paul points out that this new Christian style of worship is not like the old pagan system of one or two special spiritual people. No more shamans, no more high priests. Instead, it is for all of God's children. Everyone gets to play because the Spirit gives gifts to all for the benefit of all. We read on in verse 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. We'll talk briefly about these spiritual gifts today and more in the coming weeks. Because it's important, these things relate to over the next coming chapters. But it's important to see, first of all, that these gifts are for every Christian. Every Christian, because the scripture says here now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Every Christian has access to these spiritual gifts. Number two, these things are given for the benefit of the whole church, for the common good. Not to make the preacher look good, not to make the singer look good, not to make the healer look good, but for the good of the whole body. And that these gifts are valuable and needed. They're the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he gives them just as he determines. They're valuable, they're necessary, they're needed. And Paul lists nine gifts here, nine spiritual gifts. Nine charismata is the Greek word listed here. 
And we'll very briefly talk about them, each one. First of all, wisdom. There are some people who just give really good advice. Yes? There are people who can listen to a situation, who can cut through the mess, who can get to the heart of the matter. They're humble. They're gentle. They know God's heart. They know God's word. That's what it means to have a message of wisdom. Some people have special knowledge, information revealed to them that they could not know by natural means, a word or a feeling or an impression that is brought by the Holy Spirit. Some people have a special gift of faith. All Christians have faith, but this is more. This is boldness. This is stepping out. This is taking chances. This is being prepared to rely on God in a powerful way, to lead to plan, relying on the power of God. And I believe that church treasurers often have the gift of faith. Because when I look at the books, I go, there's no way this is going to work out. And the treasurer says, you've got to trust in God. And I say, okay. There are some people who have special gifts of healing. Some people who are very good at praying for the sick. When they pray, things are more likely to happen. There are people who have the gift of miraculous powers. They see things happen that cannot be explained by natural means. More than healing, they see God incidents instead of coincidence all the time. They see needs being supernaturally provided for, whether that's from parking spots to raising the dead. Gifts of miraculous powers. There are those who have gifts of prophecy. Now, prophecy, we were discussing this yesterday, Ross. We talked about prophecy. I'm convinced that this is not talking about foretelling the future because most of the prophets didn't foretell the future. They told what God was saying then and there, what God wanted to say to those people at that time. And those who have the gift of prophecy, I believe it's foremost about knowing what God wants to say and communicating it, knowing God's word and sharing it with people. It involves calling people to repent and believe like the prophets of old, like John the Baptist, like Jesus himself. It's closely related to preaching and teaching. There are those who have a gift of distinguishing spirits. These people have insight into things that are going on in the unseen world. They listen a lot. They practice discernment. They see things that other people do not see, and they are invaluable. Because while the prophets and the people with the gift of healing are rushing along, the people who are distinguishing are saying, hang on a minute, just wait a second, don't rush in there, listen to what the Spirit is saying. And then he talks about people who speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is talking without knowing what the words mean. It's about letting the Holy Spirit choose the words and you letting them out. Allowing a person to pray or declare things when they themselves don't know what to pray or to declare. And then interpretation of tongues is about understanding what the Holy Spirit is saying when someone speaks in tongues, sharing that with other people. Paul lists these nine gifts, these charismata here. We get the word charismatic from the nine gifts here. And charismatic is both a theological term relating to Christians who believe these gifts are active and happening today, but it's also a word used in the world. We often talk about a charismatic speaker. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about someone who can sell snake oil. We're talking about someone who has spiritual gifts. There's a deep reality here. The world's version of charismatic is not the Bible's version of charismatic. I have two notes of warning to finish. Well, not quite finish. You should never trust a preacher when he says, and in conclusion. Uh, Here, I believe, first of all, these kinds of gifts are most beneficial in smaller groups where people know and trust each other, where people can be honest and vulnerable where the group is small enough for everyone to have a turn and for each one to be held accountable. 
the kind of church community that was common in the first century, and all too rare today. And I believe that these gifts need to be practiced and developed, like learning to drive a car. You don't just give a 16-year-old the keys and say, have fun. Someone is likely to get very badly hurt. But that happens all the time in the church. Too often Christians are told they have a spiritual gift and then sent out to have fun. Disaster follows. You might say, I don't have any of these gifts. I've never seen them practiced, or if I have seen them practiced, it was weird and I did not like it. That's okay. But we need to take the scripture seriously because there is more here, more for every follower of Jesus. Because church is not meant to be just about a few special people up the front who do the stuff. We all get to play. We all have a part to play. And if you're the second chair euphonium, or you're the third trombone, or you're the second second horn, your part is important and necessary. We all have a part to play. If you don't know what your spiritual gift is, I suggest you try them all. All Christians should be seeking wisdom and knowledge, and we should all be exercising faith. We should all be praying for healing. We should all be expecting miracles. We should all seek to know and communicate God's will. We should all be discerning of spiritual matters and to both speak and interpret the words of the Holy Spirit. And the more we practice these, the more we try them, the more we will find out that we are particularly gifted and at least one of them over the others. But if you never give it a go, you'll never find out which one is for you. Think of it this way. Most of us can drive a car. Yes? There are people who can drive cars who don't have hands or feet or whatever. They drive special cars. Even people who are severely disabled can drive a car. But guess what? I can't drive a Formula One around the track at high speed and win whatever they win. Nor can I get into a semi-trailer and drive for thousands of kilometres each week. Those people have special abilities, special gifts. They're talented in that direction. You might come along and say, well, I can't drive a semi-trailer, so I'm not even going to try and drive that little Ford Prius. I'm not even going to get in when Ford don't drive Priuses. I don't know, Ford Falcon, Ford whatever. I'm trying to think of the smallest possible car, Mini Minor. I can't drive that, so I'm not even going to try this. That's not how it works. God says, let's go for a drive. Let's see what you're good at. When the policeman comes along and he's doing a high-speed pursuit, do you think he got in the car and learnt that this morning? No, he's practised it. He's done it. He knows the rules. He knows how to do it. We need to learn to grow and develop in these directions as well. Are there any questions this morning? For those who are visiting, I'd like to stop and see if there are questions. Hmm. All right, very good. So uh, it, we'd have to explain to them what you said because they can't hear. And your name has gone right out of my head as it does. Robin, I know your name, it just wasn't there. Robin's saying that Musicians are to be valued and appreciated, and we do thank our musicians who come and give their time to add to our worship. So that's this, yes, let's give them a clap this morning to all our musicians. They play their part. They play their part. And we're all called to play our part as well in the church, particularly in these spiritual matters is what Paul is focusing on this morning. Are there any questions, other questions about these things? Uh, Ross and then, oh, let's do, go Ross, Yes. <clears throat> I 
more for it, Ross. Uh, Ross is asking whether we should expect that gift of miracles to be like Moses dividing the oceans and, and walking through the sea and those kind of miracles. I, I, there's no limitation in the scripture. God says with me, all things are possible. If there's a need for a Moses today to split the Red Sea and walk people through, I believe God can and will do that. I think, though, for most of us, we're not Moses and we're not in that situation. The miracles we need are, I've got to get to an appointment on time for whatever reason and there's got to be a car park outside that building and, Lord God, please provide that car park. And when we pray, people see that happen. Not me. I end up going around the block five times. I don't have that gift. Other people have the gift of miracles is also casting demons out of people. That's part of it. Doing the stuff that Jesus did. Doing that. Seeing people. The story I heard recently was of a, of a, a fellow coming out of the McDonald's with his one burger and one chips and one Coke and seeing a homeless fellow there and with a couple of homeless people outside the McDonald's asking for food. And he goes, well, all I've got is this. And he hands them his bag and walks on with his Coke. And when he turns around and looks... They're pulling four and five hamburgers out of the bag. That somehow, miraculously, the one hamburger he had in that bag turned into five. And all those men were fed. That's God doing his thing. That's God just showing up. Those things do happen. Rarely, but they do happen. And what a miracle is, is an act of power. I had a question over here, and then I'll come back. What was your question, Celeste? I've answered your question already. That's an act of miracle right there. Boita, did you have a question? You've lost it? Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And your question is, <laughs> how do we get that opportunity? That's right. Yes. So Verita's saying, yes, she's mostly agreeing with everything I'm saying, that everyone has a gift. Uh, those gifts are of different abilities and different things. But how do we express those gifts? How do we get an opportunity to express those gifts? Is that sort of what you're saying? I want to say once again, I think these gifts are best expressed in the first instance in your small group, in your Bible study, in your home group. If we were to say this morning, right, everybody get up and speak in tongues, well, we'd have chaos and confusion and disorder. And Paul's very specifically going to warn us not to do that in the next couple of chapters. In a small group where there's five or six people in a home, you can say, right, tonight we're going to experiment with some of this Holy Spirit stuff. And we're just going to praise the Lord and see what happens. The problem is that a lot of us don't belong to a small group. We don't belong to a place where we can do that. I'll I'll say that um, I learned to preach, first off by preaching to the wall. I've heard a story about somebody preaching in their room this week, and I'm impressed and I'm encouraged. Preach to the wall and then go up and preach to the trees and then preach to the dog as you take him for a walk. And then when you're in a small group in your Bible study, you share with three or four people what you think God's telling you to do. And they say, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's we, we, we think that God is speaking through you. And then you get a chance to speak to maybe 10 people. Maybe you get a chance to speak to the ladies at the women's fellowship or whatever. And then you get invited to experiment with ministry or whatever it is. If you expect to get up in front of 10,000 people and preach your first sermon and be a prophet, you're dreaming. That's not how it works. No one's going to let someone who's never spoken to the trees or the wall or the dog to stand to 10,000 people and proclaim the word of God. It's just not going to happen. We need to practice. We need to work at our gifts. We need to develop those gifts. And so I strongly encourage everybody to be a part of a group where you can do that. What if you can't? Well, then quit your job and sell your house and become a nun. That's the solution. We're so busy with the things of that that we can't do the things of God. We need to be a part of those small groups. And if it's, even if it's just your family devotions, even if it's just you and mum and grandma and the kids around the corner getting together and doing this stuff, it's going to be really, I'm not going to, my very precious pulpit, I'm not going to bring three-year-olds or six-year-olds up to tell us what God has told them that week. I'm not going to let people who 
don't really know what they're doing, speak on behalf of God. That's a terrible thing to say, but you know what I'm trying to get at. There was another question somewhere here. Archer. Okay, so Arch is asking, if you have that gift of miracles, could you only just do one specific kind of miracles or could you do all sorts of miracles? That's sort of what we're asking? Okay. Um, I think it's open slather, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I would say that with the gift of miracles, there's a wall that needs to be knocked down. We need an act of power to destroy that wall, whatever the devil has built there to get it. We need to get that wall down. Now, I can knock that wall down with my fingernail. It's just going to take a very long time. Or I can get a little hammer and I can bang at it. Or I can get a giant big sledgehammer and I can whack it. Or I can bring in the wrecking ball and a crane and swing it into it and smash it down. As we develop in these gifts, as our spiritual muscles grow, we will find more and more things possible and available to us. But the first big wall you, run, you find that the devil, the, the God's telling you, hey, knock that wall down, you're going to run smack bang into it and bounce probably straight off it. But God's using that to grow you and to test you. He wants you to get, big, big, he wants you to get better at this stuff, to grow in this stuff. Are there any other questions this morning? The f- Are all of the gifts needed for a healthy church? Yes, otherwise Paul wouldn't have listed them. Now, having said that, we don't see a lot of these gifts anymore, yes? And we'll come to that. That's probably going to be my, that's a good intro to my conclusion that someone has a burning question. No. My email address is there. My phone number's there. I'm on holidays this week, but if you call me, I'll answer. All right, don't tell anyone. Shh. All right. Um, That's not healthy, but I'm going to do it anyway. No, I've got nothing. We're not going away. It's not a big deal. Anyway, coming to our conclusion. My conclusion this morning is this stuff's pretty weird, right? Pretty strange. If you've grown up in a secular Western country, which a lot of us have, you probably think this is all stupid or childish or dangerous or madness. Some Western Christians have even convinced themselves that all this supernatural stuff stopped in the first or second century, that we've outgrown those things. Jesus did not think that. Jesus told his followers to go on expecting the miraculous, the amazing, the weird. In John chapter 14 and verse 12, Jesus says to his disciples, Very truly I tell you, whoever, who is it? Whoever, who? Whoever, whoever. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they'll do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus' promise is that whoever believes in him can do the things he did. Jesus didn't come to show us what God could do. He came to show us what we could do with God. That's controversial. But think about it for a minute. Jesus didn't come to show us in the first instance what God could do. He came to show us what we could do with God. And he says it here. His promise is that whoever believes in me, he doesn't say for the next 100 years or the next 500 years. He says whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Jesus told his disciples that when he went to the Father, he would send the Holy Spirit, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, his followers would do all the miraculous things they had seen Jesus do, and even greater things. There is nothing in the Bible that tells us these things are over. We're just out of practice. That's my answer to your question. Yes, I think these things are absolutely vital. We're just out of practice. I grew up in a church in the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army in their book of regulations and rules said, no one is to speak in tongues in church unless there's someone there to interpret. 
But because there was no one ever speaking in tongues, no one ever learnt to interpret, and because there was no one ever there to interpret, no one ever spoke in tongues. And so it just didn't happen. And the first time I saw people speaking in tongues, there was a, I visited a church at a university and I walked in and it was weird. They all just started yammering on in tongues and I'm thinking, this is very strange. Anyway, no one was there to interpret in that situation either. These things are put in the Bible to tell us how a church should be run and should be healthy and should be full of the gifts of the Spirit. And all these gifts, I believe, should be present. The song I've chosen this morning to reflect on is a Charles Wesley hymn from the 1800s, 1700s. Uh, I got my centuries wrong. 18th century, 1700s. And Charles Wesley says this, Lord, we believe that to us and to ours thy precious promises were given, not just for the people hundreds of years ago, but for us here and now today. And he says, we wait the Pentecostal powers. Pentecostalism as a movement within the church didn't exist yet. Charles Wesley and John were inventing it in its modern sense. We wait the Pentecostal powers, the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. And because I don't know the proper tune, we'll sing it to old hundreds. Lord, we believe to us and us, thy precious promises were given. We wait the Pentecostal pass, the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Assembled here with one accord, calmly we wait the promised grace, the purchase of our dying Lord. Come, Holy Ghost, and fill the place. If everyone that asks may find if still thou dost on sinners fall, come as a mighty rushing wind. Great grace be now upon us all. Behold to thee our souls aspire and languish thy descent to meet. Kindle in each the living fire, and fix in every heart thy seat. I want to suggest to you this morning that when Charles Wesley wrote that, those words, that he didn't quite fully understand what he was asking God to do. He was asking God to show up and prove that he was real and that the scripture was true. And as people have invited the Holy Spirit back into the church, back into our world, to revive us, to restore us, to waken us again. Over these last centuries, we are rediscovering that with the Holy Spirit comes the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that's weird and strange and difficult and upsetting, and some people go mad with it, and some people go too far with it, and some people reject it altogether. Holy Spirit, kindle in each and every one of us your living fire. Come and dwell in us. Make us holy people. Make us people who walk and talk and act like Jesus. And that includes the weird stuff. Holy Spirit. Come and fill us now and use us for your purposes. Make it clear to us what you are calling us to do and how we can grow in that grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, it's 11 o'clock. Shall we call it there or do you want to sing one more song? One more song. All right, we'll invite the worship group to come. We'll sing our final song because we're going to raise a hallelujah. We're going to praise the Lord this morning. And if you do have questions or you want to discuss these things with me, please come. Make a time. I'd love to talk to you about these things. If you want to explore what it means, these gifts, you're not part of a small group, I can get you started on the way. God bless you, each one.